Lord, as we gather here today, we want to hear from you. So speak through my words and through our hearts and through our distractions. For your name's sake, we pray. When I was a child attending the Anglican Church, I could not have guessed the changes that we would witness in these past 60 years. Churches and rectories being sold, population changes, <coughs> aging congregations. We just didn't worry about those things in those days. And when I moved out here in 1984, Sure, some of the farmers were giving up and had sold their farms, and these crazy people were building vineyards, growing grapes, where the cows had pastured, where the apple trees had grown. We couldn't imagine that it would be possible to have a wine industry in this area. It just seemed preposterous. And now, many, many years later, not only do we have wine industries, we have cheese makers, we have all sorts of small cottage industries happening around in this area, and all because of the emptying out and the selling off of farms. We now have the prediction of the death of the Anglican Church by 2040. And if you still have 20 good years left on you, maybe you're planning to be around. I'm planning to be around. I don't think the Anglican Church is going to be gone by 2040, do you? If you forgot to sign up to get a subscription to the Anglican Journal, you can read it online. There are a lot of articles. It's much more dense than usual and also more interesting. It's stimulating to think about the future of the church. And I know that you're all thinking about the future of the church here, because when I was a young geezer being installed in Dunham and Frolisburg, there was a rector full-time here, and at some points there was even an assistant curate in the parish. There was a full-time priest in Stanbridge East and its satellites. There were full-time clergy much more in abundance in Cowansville and so on, St. Jean. But things have changed, haven't they? And although the prediction that the church is on its way out is chilling, I don't think the church is on its way out. I think church as we know it is on its way out the way farms as we knew them were on their way out. And a different product for the church will appear. Because one thing I'm sure of is God is not on God's way out. So God is the one who has called the church into being. God is the one whose spirit inhabits each of you baptized believers. And God is the one who makes the church. We're not the church of just good people who think kind things about God. We're the church of people who say, I believe in God, the Father, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Why? Because God said, we are to be the church. Jesus said to Peter, you are Peter, on this rock of faith. It was when Jesus said, when Peter said, you are the Christ. That's the rock, not Peter. The rock is faith. That trusting, that willingness to lean out and say, I haven't got anything else to lean on except my best hunch, my best hope in Christ. And Jesus said, and on that rock, I will build my church. Now, I think a lot of us have been building our church on a bunch of other things, like the names on the plaques, the people, the generations, the fact that we know our grandmother's watching from heaven. 
I don't know what motivates you. Or the fact that just before she died, the matriarch said, I'm counting on you to keep this church open. We're not talking about this building. And while my old way of thinking still wants to see everything the way it always was, things keep changing on me, including my body. And you know, it's interesting that we sang a hymn that's a funeral hymn before we read the gospel. And the readings are picked for the festival, the commemoration of John Chrysostom, who died, as you know, in 450 or so, or 405, whichever one of those. And uh, he died quite young, and he died quite ill because he had been persecuted. It had a hard time. It wasn't easy. He didn't build a nice little church and thousands flocked to it and everything was fine. He died young. Interestingly, the writer of this hymn we just sang died at 43. So maybe she did write it while she was dealing with illness and not knowing when she would die. But here's the thing. We're all going to die. I hope that's not news to you. And you know, we are all going to die. We just don't know when, how, where, and if we'll be ready. Will we have lived the life we intend to live? Will we have served the Lord we intend to serve? Or will we have put it on a, maybe I'll do that someday when I find the time. But right now, I've got to fill in the blanks. So what I want to know is, how are you going to be the church for the next 10 years? How are you going to be the church whether or not you have a clubhouse to go to? Because I think it's really important for us to know that the church doesn't need a clubhouse to be the church. It needs a place to gather. It needs people to encourage one another to pray, to give, to care, to forgive, to love. It doesn't need a pretty building. I like pretty buildings. I'm very fond of them. Janet, our diocesan photographer, is taking photos of your pretty building. And it's lovely and cozy in here, although I hear they don't heat things in England. But still they gather. Fifteen years ago, I was studying ways to measure the vitality in a congregation. Mark, my husband, and I were working on, on a degree, and we were trying to figure out what is it that makes a church alive. It's not just income from the offerings. It's not just bums on seats. It's not having a stinking amount of investments that feed your empty congregation. We think it's actually the number of people who bother to meet together and study the Bible together and pray together or take on some kind of mission purpose or reach out and take part in a volunteer activity in the community or make a point of standing at the door and noticing who's new, who walks in the door, of noticing who didn't get there this week, of passing on to the priest, you know, so-and-so hasn't been in a couple of weeks, I called them up and this is what's going on. Calling somebody up and saying, are you okay? I've missed you. No, I'm not okay. This is what's going through my life. Think, I'll pray for you. You want to pray right now on the phone or you want to pray silently? That's what makes a church. is people who love Jesus Christ so much that they're willing to love the people in their path in case that could be Jesus. Do you know Jesus could be sitting here right now? And we might be ignoring Jesus because we don't know his name, her name. So when I hear that the church may be dying, I want to know, are you as a Christian dying? Because it's not about how great Sandra is because she's done EFM. It's not about piling all our hopes onto Father Nicholas, because we're tired. 
If we don't have every one of you, people from this area, engaged in the ministry to the extent that you can, we're doomed. Well, the clubhouse is for sure. God's church? Well, that's up to God, isn't it? Because here's the interesting thing is that there are people not in here right now who know God and listen to God and answer to God and serve God and love God and live sacrificially for God. That out there, all these people who care about our pretty buildings but don't come in actually are hungry for the real God. They're hungry for God. Could you pray for those people? Or just think unhappy thoughts that they're not here? Could you reach out to them? See who they are. See what's going on in their lives. Could you reach out to the people who've already annoyed you, who are your neighbors? and See what you can do about building and repairing connections again. The gospel reading today reminds us that sometimes we won't be sure of the words we have to use. But it also reminds us that, that Jesus says, don't worry. I'll give you the words and the wisdom that will reduce all your accusers to stammers and stutters. So I was reading this Anglican journal. It's a great article by the Bishop of Cuba, Bishop Griselda. And one of the things she says is, Canadians are just so nice. They're so tolerant. They're open to everybody having their own opinion. But because of that, they don't actually say what they think. So I want to know, what would you say about Jesus and your relationship with Jesus? What would you say that says, this is who Jesus is to me, and this is what nourishes me and gives me joy and hope. This is where I go when I need healing and grace and mercy. This is how long we've been on a journey. I stepped out for a while, then I got back in because of. So I do recommend that you find this if you haven't already used it to start a fire. <laughs> and if you have, I suggest you look at it online because I think most of you have some access to the internet, whether it's at the library or at home. And look for the articles that speak to you. If you find the long articles too hard, start with what's in bold print and see if that interests you. Follow through. One of the other interesting articles is, a, is a, an article, an interview um, by Char with Charles Taylor, the philosopher in Montreal. Really interesting. He's a practicing Catholic. And if you look at him, you see the joy in his eyes. He practices meditation regularly, getting into God's presence, and it shows on his face. So as we install Nick as your incumbent, and as you promise to be part of this ministry, go to the source, the one who makes us into a church. And be the church. Be the church here in this place. Be the church wherever you go. Wherever you go, take the church with you. If you're going to Walmart, take the church. Be the church in Walmart. Not every day. But be the church wherever you go, and be to the glory of God. Amen.